Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, we are looking at Mark chapter 12 today. Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12 in our series through the book of Mark. As you notice in the outline that I hand out that the uh, text is there. If you want to follow in your copy of God's Word, we'll look at other scriptures as we go through. Since this is a Bible study, we'll look at other places in the Bible. How's that? First, let's read it. The text uh, called the Parable of the Tenants. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1 begins, and he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed Again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another. And they killed. And him they killed. And so with many others. So they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them, so they left him and went away. Hmm. Now, well, let's uh, notice as we break this down, first of all, let's just kind of take a survey. What do you think he's talking about here? Jesus told this parable. So that means he's teaching on something. Anybody have an idea what he's teaching? <coughs> Oh, okay. He's teaching about himself. Uh, himself versus the Jewish leaders, right? Yes. All right. Anything else? Anybody else have a... Concerning the prophets. Oh, okay. Oh, guys. You guys read up on this? <coughs> All right, so... Prophets before him. All right, he's mentioning that and the fact that he sent the landowner sent servants. What's the history of uh, God dealing with the Jewish? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's a it's a historical um, recap, kind of in parable form. All right. Yeah. Like we're about to enter into the climax of. The relationship with the Jews and and God, and so this is kind of a recap leading up to the, the final servant, the final prophet, who is God's own son. How we're going to receive him or not receive? Very good. I, I you guys are really good. Yeah, and that's very good because uh, with Jesus here teaching, uh, like has been said, it's kind of a recap of historic. It's a historical recap, but it's also pointing to himself, he's the beloved son, right? And so we look back on it, he looks back and says, look at all, they were blessed to have this vineyard to begin with, and then he sent servants, which were the prophets, and they beat them and killed them, and that's, you know, it wasn't a very, very good place to be to be a prophet of God in the Old Testament. And then, and then he pointed out to himself that he's the beloved son, and of course, they're going to eventually kill him. It's interesting that they, in that verse 12, that they perceived that he was talking about them, which made him really angry. Okay? So, let's dig in and kind of unpack this a little bit. And we'll look at the outline that we presented. And there's a question there. The first point is, God's special kindness to the Jewish nation. And it says that he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug pit for a wine press and build a tower 
and leased it to tenants and, and went into another country. So evidently this vineyard that he's describing here is a great vineyard. It is, uh, is a blessing to be part of. So the first question I have is, how did God show kindness and blessing to the Jewish nation in the past? Let's just going to break it in here, this break here point in between the Old Testament and New Testament. Let's go back to uh, the founding of the Jewish nation. Uh, where would we start? Anyone? The promise to Abraham. Okay, yeah, the covenant to Abraham. Okay, so it's a covenant, covenant to Abraham. Okay, and what would that, how would that covenant look like? What would it be? I will be your God, you will be my people, you and your descendants. Okay, so he, he promised to be his God. Okay, he promised that he would be his people, and, and through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, right? That's covenant theology. It's because of this covenant that he made with, with Abraham. Does everybody understand that? It wasn't just, you know, God didn't just haphazardly do things. He began with a covenant, and so it's, everything is based on God's promise. Okay, so let's just trace it through. Then we have the covenant to Abraham, so let's just kind of go back. It says in the book of, before we go there, let's just look at uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Can anybody quote that? If you can't, that's okay. Maybe you could read it. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Anybody have that, like Joshua? Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way to begin with. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Uh, is that yeah, that's the oracles of God. So the oracles of God, what would the oracles of God include? What would that include? Promises. Yeah, the promises of God. The law. Okay. The law. And the historical context, right? These, all the history would be... Why is the history important? When you talk about what was given to the Jews. Why, why is the history important? I know some of you are reading, like Sam, reading with me through uh, Robert Murray McShane's reading... And we're in First Chronicles, and you say, "Oh my goodness!" The, the first part of First Chronicles goes into all these details. By the way, what is what is the book of First and Second Chronicles about? What? What's the, what's the importance of First and Second Chronicles? Well, it tells us the genealogy of David. The genealogy of David, exactly. Okay, so he's reestablishing because you know this is post-exilic. They went into exile into Babylon, right? And so after that, they wanted to reestablish because they lost all the records. So he's reestablishing the Davidic line because why? Somebody's going to come out of that Davidic line. Christ, the Messiah, right? Okay. So in that portion, if you read First and Second Chronicles, especially First Chronicles, the first, what, eight chapters, a lot of genealogies there. Okay, you still reading to your cat? Yes. She doesn't like the way I say something on me. I'll stumble up. How do you that? I imagine you get that bad at that. So here's a good reminder that if, you, that if you're having trouble with the names as you're reading them, pick up a copy of the King James Version. Because the King James Version has pronunciation, every name is phonetically spelled. So you, you can tell me things about the King James before about reading out loud, but I have. Tools and they're next to this one, okay? And uh, I will do that because if it doesn't, you know, die critical marks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, why don't we eat the cat a little bit? So, what we want to know is if that cat comes to salvation. Right, exactly. All right. What other blessings that I've said that you have the oracles of God, so that would include the promises of God, the law, and the history. What else do we have? And just, I mean, you look at, I mean, they were blessed people, were they not? Just look at, I mean, in the, in the historical context, just look at Egypt, right? When they left Egypt, I mean, is that a blessing? Should that have been a, a saying that this vineyard that God has established, it says he put all these things in the vineyard. Look at how he established them and blessed them above measure. 
Okay, anything else? Why do they backslide? Oh, yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, oh, okay, remember, he was faithful even when they weren't. Right? So he showed himself great to them over and over again. The next question I have, something for us to consider, how has God blessed this nation with kindness above other nations? It's interesting, J.C. Ryle, who is uh, uh, from Britain, used the context of Britain, how God, and he asked that question, how has God um, blessed Britain above all nations? Just to stop and think about how he has blessed the United States of America above all nations. He's made us a prosperous nation. Okay. Prosperity. We're free. And freedom. Okay. Explain well, that. I would, I would say it goes back to the origin. The only men that found it in the United States, they were all believers. Okay, so the, uh, the founding fathers. Let's just say the foundation. I mean, foundation really had a biblical basis. Actually, the form of government that we have, a republic, republic government, is based upon Presbyterianism. Yeah. So the founding fathers were so affected by the the Scots, the Scottish Presbyterian brothers that came here, and the Puritans that that's how they used as a formation for our government. Okay, indeed. Um, would you say that one of the blessings that, that is a safe haven for the church? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah, at this point, you know, even in our history, that it has been a place where the church has had a safe haven, that we are not attacked for meeting in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Anything else that's a blessing for our country? Well, our hearts are actually be open to all the immigrants for, for years. You know, okay, so that's your liberty, you know, we welcome everybody. And that's a, that's a, a push and press, love your neighbor, love yourself. Okay, so there's been a nation of help to others. Okay. It's interesting how the United States of America, the church in the, in the United States of America has sent out missionaries everywhere. That, you know, the, the the world has been covered with missionaries, some good, some bad, but the missionaries have been sent from churches in the United States. It's interesting, in later years, now we have missionaries from other countries coming here. The uh, Anglican Church in Rhodesia is sending missionaries here to establish churches, the Anglican churches in the United States. The Koreans are sending missionaries to the United States. So. It's interesting, but as a, I think that that uh, one of missions has been a, a blessing for the country. It is also a reason why the, the country has been blessed. It's kind of a twofold thing. God is taking His word to the end, ends of the earth and using the technologies and the stuff of the United States of America. Anything else? What do we have in this country? The way we look back and say, "How has God blessed us?" Everybody's sitting silent this morning. They're thinking about that turkey they're going to eat a little bit later. We have lunch here at Christ Community Presbyterian Church a little bit later. Our annual Thanksgiving lunch. So everybody's stomach is growling right now. So you that are watching at home, that's what's going on. Rob, do you think about turkey today? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's look at verses 2 through 5. 2 through 5, when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and they killed him, and so with many others. Some they beat, some they killed. Now, when you read that, how does that make you feel about this, these tenants? They weren't very nice people. They were not very nice people. How is that? But how is that? Does that stir you up? Like something ought to be done about these people. It, it's disappointing. You know, they were blessed and they, they responded, in, you know, by killing people. 
Yeah. That's it. It's wrong. You know? there, there was a vineyard there, and, and a tenant got to eat of the fruit of the vineyard, but they had to give some to the owner. So here's a vineyard that the, the, vine, the vineyard owner established. He built it up, and then he turned it over to tenants and said, be good stewards. And so that no doubt it was prospering well, and so he wants some of the fruit. So they start killing the servants or beating them up. Well, it's interesting. You know, we live in the original decision. The original decision was going to be sentenced. And when he went to the tenants, they, they beat, okay? But, you know, at that time, you might say, hey, you know, these people are creeps. I need to get rid of them. And he kept, he kept sending them. Yeah, right. and more people got beat up. So, you know, you think if you were in that position, you'd say, I made a bad choice, but I need to fix this. Oh, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. Yeah, he kept... Uh, Instead of cleaning house, he kept yeah. offering to them grace. That's good. All right, so the question that goes along with that, name some ways that God demonstrated his patience with Israel. Give me some ways that God showed his patience with the nation of Israel. Okay. As the old preacher said one time I heard this sermon on whole sermon on idolatry. Idolatry? I had no clue what the guy was talking about until I realized but he he just had a different version of idolatry. He just he called it idolatry, man. <laughs> And this other preacher and I was like, what? I don't And he said, then you we shouldn't be, we, we, can, we can be involved with idol entry. <laughs> you watch him watch this thing on YouTube and say, I'm going to get Bob Brubaker for making fun of me. <laughs> okay, idolatry. They were given to idolatry all the time, right? God could have cleaned them out right then. I mean, it seems to me that can somebody recount what happened when they came out of Egypt and they were going away and Mo Moses up on the mountain? What happens? Many idols. What's that? Idolatry. Idolatry. They said to, they said to, uh, to Aaron, said, listen, we don't understand about this Moses. He's gone away. And so, he's, so he made two golden calves, right? He said, here's your gods that brought you out of Egypt. I just can't believe that. Right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, he must have docked up there. Yeah. But how could they turn on God like that? It just, it's amazing. But then we have to question ourselves. Do we ever turn on God? Yes. Do we have idols in our own lives? Yes. What happens when we get really tired? We turn to the idol, or idol of food or comfort or watching TV or, you know, we make turn to other things. Make a commitment to him one day and break it the next. Yeah. In the service and yeah. He says, God, I'm gonna I'm gonna rededicate my life to you this morning and somebody cuts you off. That never happens, does it, Bruce? <laughs> All right. Anything else about the kindness? Uh, they were given to idolatry and God didn't wipe them out. He kept showing them grace. What else? Did they kill the prophets? Yeah, they killed many prophets. Uh, they, did they listen to the prophets? Some of them listened about this much, you know, and then they sometimes they would not listen at all. So we can go through the whole ramification of how they did not listen and they did not treat the prophets very well. Uh, I think it was... Well, it's even more amazing the fact they had the Ten Commandments, yet they were bringing one of the major commandments, thou shalt not kill. Yeah. Well, they didn't like what the prophet says, so they killed him. But that's happened to many preachers, too, that the people didn't like that the preacher, you know. Run him off. I didn't, yeah, run him off. Or in, in the days of John Calvin, they actually killed him. In the days that, of, uh, as say, the commandments were uh, something they could, uh, they could read, they knew, okay, it was factual, it was quite uh, real, okay, faith, it was untangible. And I think the whole thing of them falling away, okay, and idols and everything is that they needed faith. They didn't have faith, so they created things. 
that they could see. Oh, ta tangible things, tangible yeah. objects, yeah. And we all have that. We're all, we all are frail that way. Yeah. Okay, we, and that, that's if you can see it, you can see it, you can believe it. Okay, if you can't see it, a lot of people say, if you can't see it, you can't believe it. Now, that, people use that phrase a lot, don't they? Yeah. What were you saying, Josh? That's the part of what the sacrifices were for. And a lot of these, these signs and symbols were so that people would have something that they could tangibly see it. This is, this is what God is doing for us in cleansing our sin or yeah. circumcision. This is a, a sign that seals something that we can remember. Well, and a lot of the idol worship also appealed to carnal desires because it would, it would be engorging feasting and orgies and yeah. prostitutes and stuff like that. that so. so when you see the idol worship in the Old Testament, understand it's more than just putting up a little statue you know, and bowing down to it. It had a whole lot more to do with that. Let's look at the second part of that, number two. Name some ways that God has demonstrated his patience with us. Maybe the way that he's trying to get our attention as a nation, or and the ways that he's shown patience to the United States. How does, how does that look? I think, uh, let's just look at something in our lifetime, the thing called 9-11. Isn't that interesting that we had attack on our country on 9-11? Was that a wake-up call for us? Should have been. It's interesting the next Sunday that people talked about how churches were filled the next Sunday, but how long did that last? Not very long. Not very long. And you can see, I, I'd argue that, that we're seeing a lot of that going on right now with some of these uh, hurricanes that are and fires and things like that that are going on. Everything that... Everything. God is in control of fires and winds and rain and the oceans, right? And does He have a reason for everything that happens? Yeah. Now, I'm not the one who's going to go up and say, you know, this is what God is telling you because that's not my job, you know. But everything is meant to be a wake-up call. So when people said Hurricane Katrina, okay, uh, that was God's way. Yes, it was. So is every other hurricane. Every other time there's a storm. Every time there's a thunder and lightning. Understand God's saying, I want your attention. I have control over everything here. Now, when we understand that God is doing that, and also in our country, everything that every unrest is God's getting our attention. What do we have a tendency to do when God gets our attention? God's saying, attention. I'd say some of us may pay attention, but not enough. Okay. Or some of us may pay attention and say, if those people... <laughs> we point. Yeah, we like to point the finger and say, where's, where's national repentance begin? With us. With us, with individuals. National repentance begins with us as individuals. And every time we hear of something going on, God is getting our attention. I wish those people in Washington would get their act together. Well, people in Washington won't get their act together until we do. Okay? We don't have, we don't, you know, until we get our act together and truly repent before God about our nation. Because remember Daniel? Daniel was in, in Babylonian captivity. And if you ever read Daniel chapter 7, and, and Daniel is repenting for the sins of his fathers... Okay, he was not involved in that, but he repented of that and asked God to forgive him and the nation. Hmm, that's where it begins with us. And we are turning our lives, you know, God by his grace turning us around. Well, let's move on here. The third question is the hardness and wickedness of the Jewish nation, verses 6 through 8. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Whoa. How do people in general uh, show their disdain for God? Trying to get around their lives in every area of their lives. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, people try to get rid of God. 
even today, they, people would try to do that, right? Say there is no God. Okay, and because people say there is no God, it's no wonder there's anarchy after that when people live on the premise that there is no God, so there's no law from God. There's no, I mean, it's all right to kill babies in the womb because there's no God. And so as long as they want to do what they want to do, they'll just keep going back, there is no God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1 and look at the ramification of that. Romans 1, verses 24 and 25. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice the first words, that God gave them up to their lusts. Um, that's important for us to understand. We keep pushing, pushing, and pushing and saying there is no God. I said, okay, let's see how that works out in your life. How's that working out for you? Okay, and the point what we see when they say there's no God, then people live like there's no God. And so it's all right to kill babies. It's all right to kill the elderly. It's all right to euthanize people because they're, maybe they have some affliction or whatever. That's where it's going because people say there's no God. And so God gives them up. And so I think we are seeing the beginnings of that in our country. We saw the beginning back in the 50s, actually, when people said there was no God. And then so because of that, it's just multiplying. Again, whereas we come back to it, now, us, that we have the responsibility of repenting of our own sins, the times that we've left God out of our own lives. And so that's the next question here. And number three, the second question, how do we show our disrespect for God? Give me some answers on this. How can we show our, show a disrespect for God? Taking God out of society, I think, in one way. Okay. Uh, I wanted that for us, not the country, but go re, taking God out of society. So explain by that, isn't it, Bruce? Well, for example, I remember growing up, we used to have, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance and prayer in school when the day started. Okay. And, you know, people could go to meetings and pray if they wanted without being criticized. Now, you know, if you're Catholic, Castracide or ostracize or whatever. You, you, you know, if you try and pray at a school school function. Okay. And and the same thing. It, it it's tending to be leaving meetings with public meetings and, and all aspects were just you know they they've been trying to take God out of society. Society is succeeding. Okay, I'm quite devil's advocate here. Okay, let's run with that. Let's go and let's go up. 5,000 feet. Okay, God is taken out of our society and one of the ways is there's no prayer in school or public meetings. Alright? As we back up, where does that really start? The family. Okay. Let's go back to the family. How much is, how much is prayer in the family? But let's back up a little bit farther. Where does it really start? We're the family. Ourselves? Yes, individuals. Okay, individuals. Okay, that's where it's very important. If you want prayer back in society, prayer needs to be in the family. Prayer is only going to be in the family if individuals are praying. If they're not praying, they're not going to push forward in their family. If that family's not praying, they're not going to push forward in society. And so many times we criticize what's happening here. We need to first of all look at ourselves and ask the hard questions. How's your prayer life? Well, how's the family? Okay. I mean, you don't know what are families today? It's really confusing what a family is today because you've got the same same people that are husband and wife, they're the same sex. 
You got a divorce. You got single parents. Okay, so the that, family is dissolved. Okay, okay. So we have a problem here. But where's the real problem? Your problem's here. Again, it's really easy for us to criticize this or this, and we we have a log in our eye right here. Okay. And so the first question is, how, how is our prayer life? Do we even have a prayer life as Christians? Should we have a prayer life as Christians? Well, we are, are we individual missionaries? Really? I'm sorry? Are we individual missionaries? How often do we, the people we associate with, do we talk okay, about God and the blessings that we have in our life as a result of Him, of knowing Him? Exactly. Well, Let's look at a responsibility that all of us have. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. I'll bring this up a little bit later this morning because this is part of the sermon. Unless God changes my mind. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I was, I was talking to Dr. David Nick Williams at our Presbytery meeting and I was saying, don't you have, don't you have a problem? He said, I, I want to know if he had the same problem. I, he's a much smarter person than me and he's more polished than I am. He's a doctor, right? Yeah, Dr. David Matt Williams. So I asked him, I said, Dr. Well, actually, David, I said, do you ever have the same problem I do? I said, while you're preaching, you think of something, you, you read a text, or you think of a thought that you preached on before. And all of a sudden, in your mind's eye, you see the outline. And you're really thinking. And so there's a fight going on in your mind. Should I go that direction or should I not? Because if I go that direction, it could be 10 minutes or 15 minutes more. So what do I do? And so you're, you're thinking, should I go there and edit it? Should I edit what I'm saying here? And so you think I'm just preaching up there. I, sometimes I'm at war within myself. And what I should I go there because those thoughts come from God. <laughs> so well, anyway, so that, that's why I preface. Out, we're running overtime today. <laughs> Matthew 28. I, this is something that I trust all of you know. Okay, if you don't know, I hope that you'll know it now. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay, does that sound pretty good? All authority has been given to him. Not us, but to him. Okay, because of that, he says, Go therefore. You'll hear me say later that whenever there's a therefore, the old preacher said, we must understand what the therefore is therefore, right? Okay, so what is he saying? You go because of what? Because he has all power and all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go. And what are you supposed to do? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Disciples. Disciples. If I ask you to raise your hands, you don't have to. How many people have you discipled? That means you teach them, right? Is that given to everybody? Yes. Disciples. Obviously, as individuals who have a family, the first discipleship is right here in your family. Okay? And then it's to other people in the society. Disciples, making disciples, teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ, teaching them about His Word, everything that He's commanded, right? And understand, He's with you. Who's with us? The one who has all power and all authority. That means every time that we're afraid to speak up, wait a minute, we've lost sight of who has the power. You don't. He does. And He does through you. Okay? So, most Christians have missed out because... There's this little thing called discipleship that they are have never been and never and never have discipled anyone else. I find, I find what you say family in this. Families go to church, go to church. It's also a tradition in families to follow their grandparents or great grandparents' faith. They all follow that. When you go to church, that doesn't mean you go one hour to church, children go to Sunday schools, and a lot of them, and they don't learn a thing. And 
people that go to church, they just listen and they don't pass it on and they don't know anything. Exactly, Jeanette, that's exactly what I was saying. That they don't disciple in their families. Okay? And some people don't disciple in their families because they feel like the children don't want to hear it. Okay? But that's where we have to keep teaching. But if they don't, you just go to church, go to church. Right. And at our church, you know. Sometimes people don't hear what the parents say because. My parents don't say anything a lot. Parents don't say things. And that's wrong. I know, but that's what I'm telling you the way the life is, except for the people who have the way of faith, like you folks. Other people don't do it, and that is why the families have been falling apart because a lot, I'll say for the Catholic faith, they have to go, their children, up until that children age, to be in the communion and all that. They have to go, they have to be going out. Well, that's where, that's where we need to enforce the fact that people need to teach their children, right? But the way our country is going, they're trying to take it out of the church. Next thing you know, they're going to take it out when they have the person of being inaugurated that's not going to be any clear and you're not going to have anything else. Yeah. We already have congressmen being sworn in on something other than the Holy Scriptures. Right. So... But, again, we can complain about that. Where does it start? Where does the repentance start? It starts with us. Yes, Joshua. I just want to just throw out this, this thing I was thinking. is what, what you wrote on the board there, it isn't just an opinion. Like, that's the model for how we're supposed to change society. Like, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter thought, this is injustice in this society. This is wrong in the system. And he was told to put away the sword. That's not how we go about change. And in, in Ephesians, it says, we don't wrestle against the flesh and blood. And our war is with the individual, with the heart, and we change the society through the individuals, through the gospel. We don't fight the system like Peter fights. Right. We don't fight the system. We, we, sometimes when the fight gets to the society, we take that on because it's easy to do. Again, it's kind of like an idol that we can see it. We can attack that. We can pick on people in Washington. We can pick on things that aren't right in our society. Back up. We're, what are we doing in our own families? back up even more. What are we doing in our own individual lives about personal repentance and personal time with God and personal time being a servant in the church? Then we have the opportunity to show that in our families, teach that in our families. Then we have the opportunity to, to make a difference in our society. Question number four. Set fourth question there, fourth segment here. The judgment of God upon the Jewish nation. Um, in verses 9 through 11, he says, What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the, the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. How did God judge the Jewish nation? Destroyed everything. Yeah. AD 70 is, is, you know, it was flattened to the ground. What's that? Something they flood down to. Well, there, it was a flood of, of a flood of judgment upon them when the Roman government flattened the place, scattered them around. Does this mean he has disdain for Jewish people? Okay. Yes, he has a remnant. Very good. He has a remnant. And so it was the nation that, that turned their back upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's just talk a little bit about how God shows his judgment toward us as we apply this parable even to us. How does God show his judgment toward us? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. If Nick were here, he would say, this is my favorite book. <laughs> and we'd say, which other ones, Nick? Well, they're all my favorite. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12, verses... 5 
uh, 5 through 10. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 10. Listen to the words. And you are forgotten the exhortations which is addressed to you as sons. Read it loudly, Sam. I'm not reading it loud enough, right? Right. Okay, because I have a, I have a problem. It sounds loud to me because I'm like your gates. But it must sound like a whisper to you. Yeah. Okay, I'll try and do it loud. My son! There you go. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Now faith when you are reproved by Him. How much more? For those who the Lord loves, He disciples, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For well, what son is there? whom his father does not discipline. But if you are without discipline, of which all 